Yo, what's up, everybody? It's Friday, Friday, April 12th. So we had the market down today. Big, big down day, big, big down day. And um, I'm going to get into this because the story today was earnings, JP Morgan earnings, bank earnings. And I think the real story still is the underlying fiscal, this cyclical period that we're in right now. We're coming up to a tax train on Friday. We had a tax train yesterday of 14.3 billion. We're kind of stuck this uh, month. I think net government transfers, AKA the deficit for April around 83 billion. So it's a deficit that's gonna be wiped out. That's gonna be taken out on Monday. Uh, April, the government's going to run a surplus, a big surplus, and that's a, a net drain from the economy. Swimming pool going down, swimming pool going down. Whoop, whoop. But today, let's talk about this JP Morgan. Actually, the JP Morgan earnings, they beat, they beat Wall Street estimates, but it was kind of the, the, the narrative there, the story was that. Uh, Interest margin compression, and I'm going to talk about what that means, but uh, everybody made a big deal out of that. I saw a lot of headlines saying, oh, interest, uh, you know, interest rates are starting to hurt the banks and blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. And we know that the Fed is paying interest on reserves at five and a half percent. You know, there's like three point six trillion in reserves in the banking system. There's another about 800 billion in, in the Fed uh, repo facility. Um, so that's, nothing has changed there. What happened on this margin compression, when they say margin compression, it's stop, um, uh, profit margin on interest, is that in, in the first quarter, which is what they reported earnings on, in that first quarter, 220 billion of deposits migrated from the Fed's reverse repo facility back to commercial banks. So those deposits, which were parked in uh, the Fed's uh, repo facility, reverse repo facility, the Fed was paying interest on those. When those deposits came back to the banks, now the banks have to pay, they pay interest on deposits to their depositors, right? If you have a bank account, checking account, savings account, whatever, you're getting some kind of interest paid on that. So that's what happened. When that 220 billion came back, you had a little bit of a compre margin compression. It's no big deal, but they made, you know, the market is down 500 points. Again, I, I think the down move in the market was really more the fiscal, what I'm, you know, the drain, the beginning of the tax drain. And, and today's Friday, like I got the data, yesterday's data was a 14.3 billion drain. Pretty sure today was a bigger drain and, and Monday's going to be the big sucking drain. But the st they don't understand that, okay? They, they don't follow that. I'm the only guy who follows that kind of stuff. And I tell you guys about it. I talk to you about it every time I do a video. Right? I tell you about it. And I, I help you understand it. So, but every, they always have to look for, <laughs> they always have to look for something scary and horrible. Right? So today it was mar interest margin compression. And I don't even think, you know, Jamie Dimon was, I saw some articles where he, he commented on that. I don't even think he gave a very good or lucid explanation. He's just talking about deposits, you know, migrating to the banks, ba ba ba. But that's what it was. I mean, it came from the reverse repo facility, two hundred and twenty billion, and that was it. Was just a small. They beat on everything else. I mean, the, they they beat on the the top line. They beat on the bottom line. So. Uh, you had a, you had that, and that dragged down the Dow. Everything was down. Tech was down. 
you know, we still have uh, this worry about no rate cuts this year now that has percolated back in. I shouldn't even say percolated. It's come in like a, like a hurricane that the monetarists are freaking out that there's going to be no uh, interest rate cuts this year. Uh, gold went up. <laughs> Over 20, I think it went to like 2460 and phew, right back down. Let me tell you something about gold, which I, I will repeat. And by the way, folks, when gold was back down around 1600, 1700, I don't know if you could probably go back and check out my videos, but I know that if you were a subscriber at that time, I kept saying like, if you look at commitment at the commitments of traders back then, and I kept pointing this out. Um, speculators had the least long position in gold, or maybe they were the shortest. I don't know. Anyway, they had the least exposure to gold, or the most bearish exposure to gold in something like eight years. And the uh, producers were really bullish on gold. And I kept saying that. I said, the last time we saw something like this, I said, we had like a 400 point rise in the price of gold. And I was saying that, I kept saying that, gold, you gotta buy gold down there, buy gold down there, 1600, 1700, 1800. It was, if you looked at those commitments. So we're the opposite now. I mean, um, speculators have the biggest long exposure in gold maybe in four years, I gotta go back and look, but, it, but it's, it's in multiple years, okay? But that's not what I wanna talk about. What I wanna talk about is if the stock market, if investors are truly fearful of inflation and the fact that the Fed is not gonna cut rates, the stock market will drag the price of gold down. The stock market will come, just like it dragged the price of gold up. When stocks rallied, you know, in that period from December through uh, mid-March or late March, that lit the fire under gold. And the same thing is gonna happen on the downside. Look, I think gold is a bullish long-term bet. I'm not a gold bug or anything else like that, but I do think because the fiscal environment is gonna stay positive for a long time. I mean, I, I, I go over this every single video. You know, the five pillars of fiscal support, let's just call it that, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, defense and interest payments now, the five pillars. Nobody's gonna change that. Nobody in Congress is gonna change that. As a matter of fact, one of those pillars you could almost say two, three, really, Social Security, defense, and interest, which is interest is not even Congress, it's set by the Fed. You can't change those things. Like no, no politician is gonna touch Social Security as much as they talk about it. Medicaid, they cut it a little bit. The states cut also uh, the payouts. Uh, will, will Congress cut Medicaid? Medicare, I don't know. Hopefully they won't, but... Uh, you got, let's just say, call it the five pillars of fiscal support. So like, we're gonna stay at this seven trillion leading flow level for as long as I can see un until the baby boomers start dying off, like people like me. <laughs> and hopefully that won't be for a while. Trying to keep in shape, look at that, look at that, eh? Um, ah, I got a spar tonight. I'm going sparring my boxing session tonight. So yeah, so with those leading fiscal flows, getting back to gold, I would, I would be positioned as a bull. But like I said to my subscribers today, don't chase, never chase the market. Never, ever chase the market. I've been, this is a theme I've been repeating now in these videos, like let the market come to you. The market is very, very willing to pay your price. It's also very, very willing for you to pay its price, but that's not a good deal for you. 
And the way you avoid that, that bad deal for you, is to control your emotions. Like, just don't get sucked into it. There were people buying gold today at 2460, all right? And then it dropped 100 points. So like, um, don't get sucked into that. Never, ever chase. I've been in this game a long time and I can tell you right now, there's, some, there's always gonna be opportunities. When something, you don't know how many times in my career, like early on in my career when, you know, I was so distraught and so uh, um, depressed because I thought, oh, I was waiting for this opportunity and I let it slip away and there's never, ever going to be something like this again. I literally thought like that. I'm never going to see something like this again. And you know what? I've seen a million things like that again. Just be patient. Calm down. If something gets away from you, let it get away. More than likely, it'll come back to a level where you want to buy it or sell it for that, re for that matter. If not, believe me, trust me, something else is going to come along. Something else always comes along. Like I've seen, I've seen it all, man. You know? So um, don't think about it, but never ever chase. This is like my number one rule in, in tactical trading. All right, like don't chase. Let it go. It's a very Zen concept. Just let it go. It'll come back. And that, that's almost like a life lesson, man. That's not just like having to do with the markets. That's like, that's like a life lesson. Just don't chase. If it, you know, it'll come back to you. And if it doesn't come back, something else is going to come along. Something else. Believe me when I tell you this. Something else is going to come along. So please don't chase. And that, that doesn't only apply to gold. It applies to whatever your favorite stock is. Or, or commodity or, or currency, just don't. And the way you do that is just control your emotions. Don't look at it. If, if that's the, the, the technique that you want to use, just don't look at it. I mean, one of the best things you can do is separation. I remember, um, like, in the, again, in the beginning of my career, and we didn't have like internet and stuff like that back then. I got my daily quotes. You know, if I wasn't on the trading floor, let's say I went on a vacation, I'd have to get my daily quotes from the newspaper, right? From and that was the previous day I get it. And so, like, it it was a wonderful thing that separation uh, because it 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 disassociated me from you know that frenetic tick by tick, minute by minute, hour by hour action, which, which can be so like disruptive to your thinking. You know, you, you get, it's like being in a, in a boat, being tossed around on the high seas during a hurricane or something like that. You're just, you're just bouncing from one end of the thing to the other. So I put a position, some of my biggest wins that I ever had was literally when I didn't look at what was going on. I did my analysis. I put my position on. Maybe back then I had a, had a stop loss or something. I went away, disassociated myself from the market. They didn't look at it. Then like over a period of time, I go check out the newspaper. Wow, look at that. I made a lot of money. So, if that's the technique you want to use, I'm not saying go away on a vacation, but don't don't sit there looking at it all day or even every day. Because if you don't, if you can't control your emotions, that's at least one way to keep your emotions out of the, out of the picture. Disassociation. All right. So um, that's it. I mean, we're coming up to. Um, you know, I have a, I had a situation back in March 
where a guy told me, uh, you, your timing sucks, Mike. Your time, cause I was looking for a correction. And um, he said, your timing sucks, really. But here we are, we're right, we're actually we're at a level below because he was like, I want to play this correction. I want to play this correction. I'm like, you know, sometimes I try to be as precise as possible given the data that I'm looking at. But there are always vagaries, right? But I mean, again, it's this concept, patience and not overextending yourself to so that you can ride out a little bit of a rough period. And here we are, it's below where, you know, that guy told me that I suck. So like, I don't know. I don't know what else I can, I, I, you know, that that's the way it's supposed to work. Like, yeah, it's great if it happens at the instant. But I always say to you guys, and you know this, I always say, it's not about timing. It's about time. There's a big difference. Timing is a destroyer of action. And only action can lead to results. Because if you're sitting there, you know, like it's got to be perfect. It's got to, it's never perfect. It can never be perfect. There's no such thing as perfection. I mean, we see that down to just even in physics to quantum mechanics. There's no perfection. Everything is a probability. Well, I try to be as close to, you know, the right timing. I don't, I don't consider that when I uh, strategize. I, I look at the flows, okay? And, if, you know, whatever the timing is, sometimes, you know, there are other factors. I mean, remember that gigantic NVIDIA rally that we had last month? When the market was like, everybody would melt up. It's a melt up. The NVIDIA rally, the artificial intelligence, when NVIDIA uh, came out with its earnings and, and it was a straight up melt up. We gave all that back. Okay. So, I mean, that was a case of other people being highly, highly emotional. That's exactly what I try to tell you guys how not to be. They were highly, highly emotional. And I always say like, go against emotion. That's why like, when I look at technical indicators, which is not often, but when I used to give my Forex course, I used to say, look at tick volume, volume, because volume is an indication of urgency. It's either an urgency to get in or to get out, okay? Both at the same time, really. There are some people who need to get out very quickly because they're getting blown out. There are some people who want to get in so bad, like this gold thing. And I always used to say, like, the best indicator you can use is not like, a, it's not a moving average, it's not a stochastic, it's not RSI, it's not, you know, any kind of uh, oscillator or overbought, oversold, it's volume because volume tells you it's like a barometer of emotion. A barometer of emotion. And I think that's pretty cool. And that, of course, I'm going to, I'm going to say, and I'm going to qualify it by saying there's no perfect indicator. Okay. I like to use an assortment of things, but I, I don't really rely too much, you, you know, on technicals. I look at, you know, somebody once asked me, well, Mike, where do you, where do you place your buy orders or you sell? I look at, like, if, if the conditions are good that I want to buy, I look at important prior lows and I will set my buy level just a little bit below that previous low. Maybe it was a month ago. Maybe it was three months ago. Maybe it was a year ago. I don't know. And same thing with selling. I look at prior highs. Again, maybe a month ago, three months ago, a year. And I set my sell point just above. Why do I do it just above and just below? Because I know 
as a former trader on the floor, that's the place where these people put their stop losses. And when those stop losses get hit, I want to be going against that. I mean, we used to do that as a game on the floor. It was like a cash machine. Like we would, you know, we'd buy one lot, one lot, we'd just push the price up. Everybody on the screens on Wall Street, they just saw the price going up. And then we get that stop, that buy stop or that sell stop elected. And then they, all those orders, go, you know, go off like a chain reaction. And then we're, we're just going against that. And that was like, that was good money. That was like a cash machine. Anyway, that's it for today, folks. It's Friday. Enjoy. Don't forget, go to my website, pitbulleconomics.com. Sign up for a 30-day free trial of MMT Trader. I got boxing tonight. Sparring. See you guys.